Hello, so I'm going to do a video um, talking about a bit of the history behind the Russian invasion of Ukraine and my predictions for it. Now obviously this is the sort of video that where I'll have opinions and they might upset people. Um, also there's going to obviously be people where, um, you know, some people are going to be upset either way. I'm um, For just the sake of clarity, even at the very beginning of this video, I'm going to turn the comments off because with this topic it seems you can't have, unless you're doing it live and chatting with people live and you can get an idea if it's a real person or a bot or a shill or whatever, um, you'll get people attacking you on the, uh, either side and you'll also get, you know, like a lot of disinformation type comments just being spammed. So as a result of that, comments are off because otherwise, you know, the comments are going to turn into a nightmare section um, like they did on some of the other videos, even if you don't express any sort of strong opinions. So obviously, we're about a month into now the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, oh, and just to point out, if you can see some cotton wool in my ear, that's because I've got a little bit of an ear infection blocked here at the moment. So I'm putting stuff in it, you know, obviously keeping it in with that. Um, so, basically, let's get started. So, obviously, last month, Russia invaded Ukraine in several different areas, north through Belarus, into the sort of Chernobyl exclusion zone area, heading towards Kiev. And, um, or Kiev, and then, um, you know, from the east as well. Several different areas, obviously, with several different objectives. Now, there's obviously different theories because at the moment we don't know why the Russians have invaded. You know, you can take a good guess it was to take over the country based on all the different prongs of attack. Um, so, one of the more sympathetic sort of arguments to the Russian perspective, I'll just move the light a bit so it's not so bright on the camera. Um, and obviously, by the background flag, you can obviously guess which side I'd be supporting the sovereign country that's been invaded. But the most fair, um, I guess, argument for the Russian invasion would be. From their perspective would be the worry of not having a buffer state between them and NATO. Obviously if you physically took over Ukraine and stored your own government then you've got NATO on your borders anyway um, and obviously this was a dumb idea because it's made lots of other neutral countries now want to join NATO because they've seen that the country that wasn't a member of NATO has been invaded and therefore don't have the same level of protection as a NATO state. So again that was a dumb idea but that's the more sympathetic one I can understand towards Russia. Another Russian claim is that there was a genocide going on with basically no evidence in eastern Ukraine. Again, people keep bringing stuff up. It's the sort of thing that when you look into it, you can find very, very little evidence of it happening. So there's stuff like that. Um, you'll get also a lot of whataboutisms that Ukraine did something in the past, you know, like decades ago, hundreds of years ago. Therefore, Russia has the right to invade again. That's a stupid whataboutism that really, really ouch, I guess, is... Um, sort of Kremlin propagandist because again throughout the Cold War it was always whataboutism you know like the Soviet Union is allowed to do something bad because America or Britain did something bad in the past yes we have done bad stuff in the past we shouldn't you know cover it up it should be you know almost a shame on our country for doing bad things but that doesn't give you the excuse to do a bad thing yourself um, now one of the theories to me that sounds the most likely is that because Putin is a massive sort of history buff in kind of the armchair historian way he basically wanted to resort, res restore a lot of the sort of Tsarist Russian empires. So not necessarily the Soviet Union, but lots of stuff that used to be under sort of Russian, sort of the Kingdom of Russia, whatever you want to call it, Russian Empire control, he wants to bring back. And obviously lots of Ukraine was part of that. Um, so that would be my perspective, that it seems like he's kind of got his own deluded version of Russian history. It'd be basically a bit like as somebody in Britain saying, because the British Empire used to control lots of stuff in the past, we need to start retaking his territory. Most of these countries are all independent now and don't want anything to do with us anymore, so we should probably leave them alone. Now, to give you some perspective on some of this, especially if you're in the UK, I think the easiest way of us imagining it over here would be to say Wales or Scotland voted to leave the United Kingdom, basically became the completely own independent countries rather than being like semi-independent like they are now. Then in 30 years odd time, um, basically England deciding that we want them back and coming up with some weird excuse for it, but you know, blatantly deciding to send loads of troops in and take it back over. That would be the easiest way I could actually summarise it from our perspective, you know. Um, and this will also play in a lot when we talk about demoralised soldiers and everything like that, because I can imagine if you're an English person in 30 years time if Scotland got independence, you were told to go in there and shoot Scots that, you know, it's some of them peacefully resisting you and then others fighting back and you were told to say shoot the Scots, you know, or like bomb Scottish towns and cities because they're not surrendering to you. 
it would be the same level of demoralisation. Most people in England would not want to do that for obvious reasons. I'm sure there'd be some stupid minor minority of you know English soldiers that would want to do that. But you can understand the complete demoralisation, and also from the Scottish standpoint, the way it would radicalise more people to then want to fight against England and invading. So that, that gives you a good idea of at least how I would think about it. So that's most of the background stuff, I guess, out the way, so we can go on to like what's going on in the predictions. I'm going to stop the video and restart it at several points to you watching, you shouldn't notice too much, but I have a feeling with my webcam, if I try and do it in one continuous take, it will just not record the whole thing, and then I'll have to redo it again, so... Let's stop this here and go on to what's going on in Russia or Ukraine now. So what we've gone, um, got you know, going on at the moment is that basically um, we're a month in at this point and what initially happened is obviously the Russian army seemed mostly peacefully, and I say mostly, sort of tried to send sort of a rush of troops into various areas to sort of capture them. As in, I think they were trying to pull off what they did in Crimea in 2014, whereas the idea is that you rush in a lot of troops Hopefully nobody really fights back, and then you can seize control of key objectives. Obviously that totally failed, because of the fact that when the troops rushed in, they were met by heavy Ukrainian army resistance and sort of paramilitary resistance, and lots of them were wiped out or had to fall back. Um, the only real place the Russians managed to hold for any significant time was Hostomel Airport, um, near Kiev. Or Kiev, and um, that was where basically the VDV managed to do sort of a big helicopter sort of airborne landing hold it for a few hours before they were essentially completely wiped out because they had no ground support. You know, I think the idea was that nobody would really fight back against them, they could hold the airport and their ground troops would meet up with them. The ground troops basically never got there due to poor logistics or, you know, not knowing what was going on or coming under fire and sort of holding position or retreating, whereas obviously VDV got encircled and wiped out. Um, so that was what happened in Kiev, and for the first day or two I don't think there was that much fighting there other than Hostel. You saw a lot of helicopters and planes shot down initially, well obviously the helicopter rushes tried to go into places and then they were shot down. Um, what ended up happening where it started to get really bloody from the sort of third day on was where lots and lots of Russian troops just seemed to be sent in willy-nilly to various places, you know, not really knowing if they were actually meant to be attacking or not. Um, and then obviously when you have really poured out, you know, poorly planned out logistics like this of just sending lots and lots of troops in, you know, without any clear objectives of what they're doing, you know, big convoys, obviously they're going to get ambushed, and that's what happened a lot, you know, there was lots of videos and pictures, I'm not going to include any of them here for obvious reasons, but you can find them online quite pretty easily, of, you know, lots of dead Russians in their troops and vehicles, where basically they'd been ambushed by machine gun fire and, like, rockets, and, you know, some of them didn't even have time to realise what was going on before they were incinerated or, you know, turned into confetti by machine guns in their vehicles, so that happened around a lot of the country. Um, now, obviously, another dumb reason for this invasion taking place when it did, even though obviously I'm completely against the entire invasion, I think it was dumb, they should never invade it in the first place, was basically that it's the mud season in Ukraine at the moment. Now, one theory is that because Putin didn't want to piss off uh, Xi Jinping, he did it not during the main Olympics. And obviously, the mud season is famous in Ukraine for where basically only the roads are really usable, the fields are kind of like feet of, you know, feet thick, muddy, sloggy, sort of horrible material. So even lots of tracked vehicles break down or sort of have issues in them. So where you would, under Soviet doctrine, have this massive kind of full to gap tank push where, you know, all the tanks are in the line, the IFE is following them with all the helicopters and the Heinz and that flying overhead and the artillery pounding everything, sort of Blitzkrieg style. Um, what, what you've got here is basically everybody confined to a road. And obviously it should come as no surprise if you saw the pictures of that stupidly big convoy that putting lots and lots and lots of vehicles on a narrow road for miles and miles and miles is a really easy target. And if the Ukrainians actually had a bigger, you know, more powerful air force, you'd have seen the highway of death and desert storm carried out. Thankfully for some of those Russians, obviously that didn't happen because Ukraine didn't have the air superiority to do it. But they still did, you know, little hit and run attacks with infantry here and there and of the Bayakta drones. Um, director how it's pronounced the Turkish drones and uh, is it TB2s you know blew bits of it up and it seemed like the Ukrainians did the sensible thing of targeting the fuel trucks and the food trucks like you know the actual logistics vehicles the most because obviously the tanks and everything else can't run without them you know if you blow up a tank that's one less crew to feed and one less tank to refuel whereas if you blow up a supply vehicle that's several tanks or you know BMPs or whatever else IFEs that aren't going to be running um, so obviously the convoy stalled essentially and eventually I think dispersed and it's now in various places. Um, 
So obviously you're seeing the complete terror bombing of civilians, because I guess the tactics changed after a few days in, where rather than just strictly trying to target military targets, uh, Putin threw a fit of rage and it was basically do a Grozny, do an Aleppo, terror bomb civilians to the point of surrender. But the thing is they're not surrendering. So what's happening is obviously they're all just dying. Um, and we've seen obviously some horrifying scenes in various cities around Ukraine, especially Mariupol, which is basically completely encircled and cut off. People are starving now. You know, buildings where the women and children are trying to hide to make themselves not a target are the ones specifically being bombed. Uh, again, war crimes, but, you know. Um, and, and as I said, just this whole thing does really upset me. This is again why I'm trying to not do too many videos on Ukraine, and, you know, I always try and have the fundraisers on them. And again, I've had to block people I used to previously get on with quite well because you'll get people saying, like, this is all made up. There were no women and children in those buildings, you know, even when you see the fucking pictures. And it's, it's disgusting that people are, can be so, you know, propagandized. They take that attitude. And again, I, of course, I believe there's Ukrainian propaganda, but we, we know which country's been invaded and which towns are being encircled and bombed. Um, so that, that's what's obviously going on there. Now, what, what you're seeing is very horrible attrition of Russian troops in the sense that they keep getting pushed forward, it seems, in places, you know, and getting wiped out. Because, obviously, if you're defending, you're meant to have about a 3 to 1 advantage in terms of, you know, the enemy needs three times as many troops to take your position. Because of the fact that if they're having to cross open ground or whatever, their machine gun targets, their rocket targets, whatever else. Now, even though Russia has overwhelming artillery and everything else, um... You're seeing in a lot of places, because the troops are running out of food or fuel, they're just abandoning their vehicles. So Ukraine has actually apparently got more tanks now than they started off with, just simply due to the Russians abandoning them. And it's not just tanks, they've actually captured some really expensive AA systems and um, like military intelligence type vehicles, which apparently you know, the Americans are really paying out the arms to get their hands on now because of you know how strategically important it is for America to get their hands on these. Uh, you've heard of like peace talks and that going on that don't really go anywhere. I think because Ukraine's got demands, Russia's got unreasonable demands, so they can't really meet there. When there's meant to be humanitarian corridors, they're supposedly being attacked like every day by certain amounts of the Russian troops. Whether or not that's a direct order, we don't know. I'd expect it is, but you know, um, regardless, a lot of people don't trust the humanitarian corridors now because they're continuously being shelled. There's also been a lot of journalists killed, you know, clearly identified as press and being shot by Russians regardless, or shelled by Russians regardless. So, um, let's go on. Now, obviously, the thing I really want to point out here is I have nothing against the average Russian, which should be no surprise to the people that have been following this channel for a while, because I find a lot of Soviet stuff, even though I dislike the Soviet government, really interesting. You know, I used to talk to a lot of Russians through this channel. I've not heard from any of them in ages, probably because their internet's been cut off, I assume, or YouTube's blocked, along with lots of other platforms. Um... So obviously in Russia itself, lots of the media has been cut off and you get something like 10 to 15 years in prison, don't you, for disregarding the special military operation or spreading fake news about the special military operation. So although some Russian state media stuff has been banned over here, um, you can still find it quite easily if you want to and there's no laws against looking it up here. In Russia it seems that you'll get decades in prison, sort of go to gulag style, for trying to... Um, look up independent press, which probably gives you a good idea of which side is lying to its people. Now in terms of um, demoralization, there's lots of really upsetting phone calls you can find between like Russians phoning their families at home, where they've taken mobile phones, phoned their home number and are talking to their family. Um, and some of these, if you listen to the translations, are really horrible. The one that really got me is allegedly, because I don't know if obviously all these are true or if some of them are propaganda, but they're bloody good propaganda if they're true. And like not true if they are propaganda is um, where there's basically a Russian dad phoning his wife and kids, um, trying not to cry, basically knowing he's going to be dead soon, you know, saying basically he wants to speak to his kids but not, you know, upset his children. And then when he's talking to his wife, he's breaking down because he says, you know, he, he knows he's, he's not going to survive, basically. And that stuff is really hard to listen to. And again, this is why I don't really wish any ill will on Russian soldiers, especially ones not doing war crimes that are just stuck there against their will. Because, you know, imagine being sent into that you know, you're being shelled everywhere, you know, airstrikes everywhere, vehicles around you randomly blowing up, running out of rations, everything else, because you were sent in basically by a dictator for an unclear military objective. Um, for those guys, guys, I really feel sorry for them, and at least I've heard, you know, and I hope this goes as planned and these sort of people aren't tortured or executed or whatever if they do surrender, that apparently there's a scheme in Ukraine where you get something like 7,000 euros if you surrender, 
you know, they, they do away that if you've got a phone that you can contact the Ukrainian army through some sort of thing and they, you know, negotiate a surrender point so it can all be filmed and documented and then, you know, you're taken to a place where hopefully for the rest of the war you won't be shelled or bombed, you know, you're given food, you probably get to call your family now and again, um, you know, and then hopefully when the war is over it's all sorted, but as I said, it's a pretty horrible situation, but I think for guys that are, you know, trapped, you know, starving, getting frostbite, you know, cold, wet, everything else, you know, um, the best option would be for you and your family to, if you can hand yourself over with at least some guarantee of being treated civilly, that would be your best option, unless you can somehow make it across your own lines, you know, and desert that way. But it does seem a lot of guys are apparently being shot or, you know, given fines or imprisonment if they make it back to their lines because you abandoned your position. And what it sounds like is a lot of the commanders are just getting drunk and basically not doing anything to boost the morale of their men. And again, the Russian army, based on the Soviet army, does not have a system like we have in Western armies of, um, you know, NCOs and everything. So it seems like a lot of the regular grunts are just abandoned, basically, on the front lines and basically told, you just sit here or you advance or else. Um, so obviously that's not good. So what are my predictions? Um, I definitely think Ukraine will win. In what way will they win? I don't know, basically. Um, and at what cost to how many more civilians and soldiers on either side? In the sense that um, I'm sure lots more Russian troops will die, I'm sure lots more Ukrainian troops will die, and I'm sure lots more Ukrainian civilians will be bombed or starved in besieged cities. But Ukraine is going to win in the sense nobody expected at the start of the war just because of their resolve and all the Russian logistical issues. Um, so now the worry is, does Putin keep escalating it, you know? bomb more civilians and stuff like that, but it does seem the Russian army at least has no more will to fight, at least in a lot of it, from the intercepts we're getting. Because again, what are they fighting for, like I was saying earlier in the video, if you're an English person being told to invade Scotland or whatever, you know, bomb Scottish, you know, houses and stuff like that, you'd have no will to do it, you know, and it's pretty obvious why morale would break down pretty quickly in that sense. You know, you're not comfortable following out your orders, your survivability isn't good and you're cold and wet, you know, running out of food. So it seems, at least on the side of Russian troops, they're very demoralised, and you'd hope that means most of them surrender peacefully. Um, I saw that there was even now a Russian brigade fighting against the Russians, where you know some Russians are somehow going through some sort of channel to fight their own army. It's, it's very bizarre. You've got Belarusian volunteers doing the same thing. There's lots of Western volunteers, like ex, you know, U.S. Army, ex-British Army. Lots of other ex-armies going over to fight for the Ukrainians. There's videos of them on the front lines as well, you know, where they're next to burning Russian equipment, talking whatever their native language is. Um, so they're definitely at the front lines rather than being used as a propaganda piece. Um, so, you know, we have to hope Putin doesn't escalate it, as I said before, to chemical or nuclear weapons. He'd be really stupid to do that, but he's done a lot of stupid things so far. Um, now... I think Zelensky said he's willing to compromise some of Crimea and like Donbass or whatever it is in exchange for, you know, a neutral status, Russia completely withdrawing, Ukraine being allowed to have its own big army and then just being a neutral country, which I think at this point would so suit most people well to end the bloodshed. I imagine with all this stuff though there's always conversations going on via the back channels that maybe he is planning on joining NATO, um, you know, and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, he's not going to say that publicly. Because again, with lots of these things, if you can get a deal, you know, you could imagine a few years in the future, he might just get an express NATO membership so Russia never has a chance of invading again. But what, what we've seen is basically complete decimation of the Russian military image. Again, although they've not committed anywhere near the full size of their army on paper, we do know not look, a lot of their old vehicles are essentially just scrap metal sitting in scrap yards. You know, well, not scrap yards, but in massive fields, you know, all the tanks just parked there, exposed to the elements, that they're not going to start running quickly. And judging by some of the stuff we've seen blown up or captured in Ukraine, they're sending stuff in they can't afford to lose, or, you know, you never expected to see on the front line, as in old museum prototype tank type things, like the T-80 uh, UK, was it, and some of the others that are going in, um, T-80 UNs, I think, you know, like models that they only had a few of full stop, because they were kind of like limited prototype runs. So it says something about what Russia's willing to send in, and again, although I think they're like more like the Donetsk militias Russia funded and things like that, you're seeing those guys with things like PPS-43s, Moss and the Gants, you know, stuff that 
really the 21st century war being fought with World War II weapons is bizarre, but you're seeing guys with that equipment. We've not even touched on Russian military corruption, which is another thing. Again, the conscripts at the bottom get fucked the hardest, both figuratively and literally in terms of male prostitution in the Russian army, but um, basically what happens is because it's corrupt at the top down, lots of people sell off equipment that should be going to troops and the fuel and stuff like that, and the troops never get it. Up until recently, you literally could buy from .ru websites Russian military gear that was brand new, like Ratnik gear. So the troops obviously didn't get issued it. So you're seeing more and more pictures of troops not having a proper body armor or equipment because somebody up the supply chain sold off their equipment to Westerners like me, who bought this sort of stuff because um, it was cool. Um, you know, and then it turns out the actual Russian army don't really get this gear. So when some people are saying all oh, this Russian equipment so garbage it doesn't work, a lot of it is because the Russian troops didn't even get their own equipment. That's why you're seeing them with like the really cheap Baofang type radios, um, because basically their commanders sold off their good radios and bought the cheapest Chinese stuff possible to equip the soldiers with, so people know what the Russian troops are doing so they can listen in on their conversations. So that about sums it up. As said, my predictions are this war is going to grind on longer. Putin is going to become more and more unpopular, Russia is going to have more and more sanctions put against it, countries that are kind of neutral with all the sanctions at the moment are probably going to get more and more alienated because of the fact that, you know, as this goes on it just looks worse and worse for the Russian regime, um, and it's just kind of the sad question of how more civilians die in the process. As I said, this is not a nice video to record because of just how much human suffering there is, and as I said, if, if you're going to look into this war, please try and look at as much information as possible. And don't, you know, just believe one outlet because it says one thing, because that's where you start getting the people that say stuff, you know, like, all the women and children being bombed isn't really happening, it's crisis actors and all that kind of crap. You know, you don't have to believe everything Ukraine says for obvious reasons, but, like, at the end of the day, it's just massive amounts of human suffering, that's what's going on. You know, Russian soldiers being slaughtered, you know, or dying of frostbite and whatever else, gangrene. You know, Ukrainians dying, Ukrainian civilians dying, uh, massive refugees exodus. You know, it, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And, and this is why I find it weird when people find a lot of it funny. Um, you know, I, I'll find some of the VDV memes funny and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a horrible human tragedy that was for no real purpose. And again, if Putin's objective were to, you know, stop countries joining NATO and make NATO weaker, he's actually solidified the West in kind of... Um, friendship we've not seen between a lot of our countries and why we used to squabble with each other. You know, as somebody who voted for Brexit, the UN kind of looks, not the UN, the EU actually kind of looks attractive at the moment because of the fact they're all cooperating with each other rather than squabbling in little, you know, messes. So, um, obviously my, my only real thoughts from this is I really want this to end as soon as possible, the least amount of deaths possible. Um, and I really hope for Russians that they get a government eventually or soon, sooner rather than later, you know, where people aren't imprisoned for, you know, doing whatever, that they get a proper democracy, and, you know, with the average Russian, our sort of people can get on with them again, because obviously, I said, most people my age don't hate Russians at all, um, and I have heard most of the Russians against the war in Russia tend to be the younger Russians, which makes sense, you know, they can use the internet more, and they're, they're aware what, you know, how much their government's lying to them. We have seen a brain drain as well from Russia where the young Russians with skills are just fleeing the country en masse before they're conscripted because who would want to live in Russia with all these sanctions at the moment and a regime that can throw you in prison or conscript you as cannon fodder? You know, if you can get out to another country and get a better paying job there, please do it, you know. Think about going back to Russia when it's, um, you know, a country that's more deserving of you. Uh, anyway, it's a sad video to record and I said I'll put the, um, what do you want to call it, the, um, charity link somewhere in there, the one done for YouTube, because obviously money going for towards humanitarian aid is probably always a good thing at the moment. Anyway, demoralising video, but there you go, um, it's not a pleasant subject.